Let me preface it by saying, uh, um, never say never, and don't always say always, usually say usually. So for those of us working out of our bedrooms, um, what tips could you give to us if we're working in an untreated small room, you know, mid-level or budget speakers to handling low end and getting the low end dialed in in a way that's going to work on a larger system? Wow. Um, I, I'm not sure I can satisfactorily answer that except experiment. Um, that's what I do. Uh, I work in a small room with stone floors and um, you know, both rooms I've had for my my, stu my home studio, this is where I've been working for the last 10 years. Um, I've just got a new one, uh, just moved. Um, I've, done, I've done the treatment myself. Um, some half rounds and rugs, that's it. I don't have bass traps, none of that kind of, you know, nothing special. Um, and I just move it around until it sounds decent to me. Um, feedback is always good. Uh, I mean, not audio feedback. <laughs> Um, that, um, you know, to get confidence in your room. Because that's really the thing. You know, I don't always know what I send out is perfect. But when I hear back from mastering or the artist and they've played it on a lot of systems, then I, you know, after a while I start going, okay, it must be all right. You know? But, but I, I'm not very scientific about it. Hi, Chad. How are you doing? I'm, I'm <laughs> good. I've, I've been a big fan since uh, Los Lobos days and oh, yeah. things like that. Great, oh, thank great, you. great, great work, man. Great thank work. You. Thank you. Thank uh, you. How's Mitchell Froom? Did you ever? Mitchell's good. He's always good. He's he's he was fantastic. He, he is. I, I he's, don't see much of him, but no, he's an amazing guy. He's great. Thank you. Now, now you, you were a board mixer. Are you still a board mixer? Or are you in 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 the box mixer? I'm now. I'm in the box. Okay. Why did you decide to go into the box? That's been a big uh, wonder. I wonder why. Well, there's lots of reasons, but the main reason was convenience and economics. Um, I was working at a studio called Real World, Peter Gabriel's place in, in England. And I, I worked there for about six years. I was there every day um, doing stuff. And it was sort of, I don't know, 2006, 2005, 2006. It was all SSL, right? Where, yeah, it was SSL. Um, and it, it just seemed like, you know, budgets, the studio, um, everything started drying up. The studio couldn't give deals anymore. Um, I was doing bands like Los Lobos, who would, they, they'd call me to mix a record, but their budget would be so low, it would only cover the studio cost and not be able to pay me. Um, and, you know, I, I did it, but um, my wife uh, convinced me to go in the box. She was chief engineer at, at Real World. And um, so, you know, she was the one that kind of pushed me into going for a studio, which I never wanted at home which I'm really happy I got him, but, um, uh, and, um, it, it wasn't an easy road. I really had trouble. I, it took me a long time, um, to, to get into it, but, um, I love it. And, um, yeah, I have no love affair with analog at all. I don't, you know, I've, I've got, you know, there's plenty of bad things to say about digital. There's plenty of bad things to say about analog. I think it's pretty equal. It comes out in the wash to me. For me, it's just up to what you want to use. And it can be, it can be during the day too. You know, if, if I had an analog studio, I'll get there. If I had an analog studio, you know, I might wake up in the morning and go, oh, wouldn't it be nice to do a work on a desk today? You know, like proper analog desk with this gear and, and, you know, throw the mix to tape and then see what happens. Um, but I don't, it, it would rarely be like a, an actual audio or musical decision I just, it's just be my well, how, what do i feel like doing today I can, I'll, I'll use whatever you know and I'm, i i can make it work for me I, I can't always make it work for everybody else but i can make it work for me yeah thank you very much yeah sure um we had something over here hey uh for one uh thanks for the inspiration one uh two uh what is your Okay, I know your favorite plug a plugin to use on guitars and bass and everything else is Sansamp, but how would you compare that to other things uh, that you would possibly use as an amp sim? Well, there's so many different you know plugins. Um, 
Sans amp for me, I've just been using it for so long, starting with the pedal, right, which I love. Um, I use the plug-in mostly now because I'm in the box and it's convenient. Um, but I still have some pedals that are you know, hooked up. Once in a while, they get they get turned on. Um, but I, for me, yeah, Sans amps always had a special kind of distortion. I don't know how, even in the plug-in, um, I don't know how they've done it. I've never asked. Um, it's just something I recognize as desirable to me. And I know how to utilize it as an EQ and, um, you know, as something to play with phase um, and, uh, and distortion. So all of those things. Um, I'm just most comfortable with it. There's lots, like the capitator is also something I use, which I love. Um, but I guess I'm more associated with the Sans amp because of it's been a number of years where the decapitator's relatively new. But I use both, you know. Is that, is that all right for an answer? All right. My question was about your work with on Peter's record. The thing that really amazed me about that record was how close everything was, how dry and immediate. And I was wondering, was that your design? Um, and if it was, what were the things that influenced you up to that point? Because it, to me, it's a very bold statement and very, very different. Everything's very close and very dry, but there's still a really beautiful um, impressionistic quality about it. I just thought in terms of sound design and things like that. But. I like that impressionistic quality. It's a, no, it's lovely. I, I, I think it, I, I'm, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it was. I mean, P Peter gave me pretty free reign on that record. Um, I think he had so much recorded. Um, he was happy to have somebody come in and just do it. Um, so th that was pretty fun. Um, as far as um, influence, um, if you mean influence um, in the moment, it's always just the music. Um, I try not to think about things. I, I don't ever really have an end goal in in the moment, right? I, I just like to follow a path, connect the dots. I don't know where it's gonna go. Right. And so I'll sit and, and I just like, um, yeah, I don't like, I like to jam, you know? So um, at all times, recording a band, I'm, I'm, I don't like pre-production. I don't like thinking about things before going. I just like going in starting something and let's go let's see what happens um because for me the thing about having expectations uh i don't know somehow that's a brick wall to me an expectation you're trying to reach that i have a sound in my head i want to get that sound nothing else is going to be good when you might bypass and and miss all sorts of things that are wonderful but it's not the sound you had in your head so I try not never to have a sound in my head, you know. I, I just wanted to go for it. But it, if you mean what the influences are, like that led to that, is that more what you meant? Um, it's, it's yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, there's records. Um, there's all sorts of records that uh, that have influenced my my taste and sound. Um, and I, I sort of happened on just just this year. I happened on one song because people were asking me this question, and and you know you could rattle off albums that everybody's heard, and but um, I did. I found one kind of obscure song that I thought really summed up what I love and what really you know gets me off in music. Um, and it was a King Crimson song on an album called Islands, and it's called Ladies of the Road. And um, it's not something that, you know, you can just switch off the lyrics, you know, but, but listen to the sonics and the playing and the way it's put together. And it's a weird ass track, man. It's like uh, um, dry in your face. And I think it's something that I really love. I love, I love music that comes at you. I want, I want it to be confrontational. I want, I want I want the music to be going like that, and and then coming up and maybe coming at you here, you know, and then maybe contrast a section or something, maybe or another song on the album with it 
moving away, you know, as a contrast. But I generally like stuff that confronts you in music. So, yeah. Thank you. I like um, so I, I've heard on a, a few interviews with you um, talking about using distortion in uh, parallel with things, like running distortion on a, a send. Um, do you generally do that per instrument, or do you have a send that is um, like has multiple instruments interacting in the same distortion uh, box? Um, or is there any convention to it? Yeah, both. Um, sorry. Um, well, there's lots of different kinds of distortion too, aren't there? And um, you know, there's compressor distortion. There's um, you know amp simulators and the saturator distortions, and um, and I use a lot of plugins. I mean, I I really use a lot of plugins, and um, so it's coming from all kinds of areas. But it's not necessarily something you'll hear as distortion like square wave or jagged waveform distortion right um it may be something that's just mixed in really very very little compared to the original signal um uh, for me the distortion i was uh, talking to some people uh, at a seminar yesterday about it and it's um i i really find distortion really interesting because it's um it, um and it, i'm still exploring it i really you know it's a it's a really cool thing about humans what and and i don't know what the physics of it are um but uh distortion does something to us when we hear distortion and it would have been before you know having sound systems it would have been distortion would have been things are too loud um, whether it was um i don't know uh you know a volcano going off and cracking the air right um, or um, uh, just whatever can be so loud that it would distort your eardrum, distort the air. Um, it would be a danger signal, right? And when we hear distortion, you get a, an adrenaline thing. You, your mind says, up, oh, danger. So I, I really like using that idea, um, but just in little ways, you know, so you can have something clean, beautiful sounding scape, right? Of, and then just have a th one thing in there be that little danger. <clears throat> There's this little bit of distortion. And you might not even hear it or notice it as, you know, you don't have to be hit over the head with it. I know sometimes I do hit you over the head with this distortion, but not always. Um, so I, I, I really, I like to think about that idea about what the distortion does, not just that you're adding distortion on everything. But why are you adding it here? Why is it going here? What what are you trying to achieve with it? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we got one, two, three. Okay, how's that? I see. So I see this. I'm watching YouTube and I come across this thing that said, "How to record Chad Blake drums," and I'm thinking. You can't record Chad Blake drums. Only Chad Blake can record Chad Blake drums. Anyway, so he goes to this whole big thing about how you take the kick drum and you run it to a bus and then you bring it up in parallel, uh, you know, some sort of distorting plug-in like a, <clears throat> what's it called? Oh, yeah, sans amp. Okay, so then they, uh, and then they put an equalizer, but they said, but it's not going to work unless you put it at a polarity. Uh, is this true? Um, I don't know anything about it. Really. Perfect. Um, perfect. Yeah, exactly what I said, thought you'd yeah. say. You'd yeah. Say. No, I, I don't know anything about it. Um, I, I'd have to see it. I don't know, but that's, um, yeah. Um, it's a funny thing. I mean, I, is it a, a video for recording a drum kit or is it a, what? It's called how to get, uh, how to, how to, how to get or how to record Chad Blake drums. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, sorry, I can't really comment on it. I don't know what it's about. I mean, I can tell you how I record drums. It's like everybody else. Um, maybe the one, the mono mic, you know, thing, um, I do treat, I do things to it, either with sans amp or heavy compression or put it in 
mechanical filters. I like to use mechanical filters, like pipes and things. Um, yeah, I think like my question may be, be related to his question and the sense up. Because when I put the sense up, the, the, the one that comes with Pro Tools in a send and I send a drums uh, to it, it's out of phase that I don't like it. But I know you do. Maybe I think it's the EQ that you play and the polarity that makes it work. Because usually it's out of phase and it's, it's... Well, here's the thing. I mean, sometimes it is out of phase, but it just depends on what else you're doing, right? Because delay compensation changes all the time. It's kind of unnerving. But um, yeah, I'd say uh, for me, it's only about a third of the time does it come up. Does it give me an out of phase thing? Yeah, um, on ascend. Now, maybe it's the way, I don't know how you're doing it. I mean, my, I have a bus send, which comes back within my drum submix, right? It's not outside the submix. Do you know how, are, are, is your sans amp outside your yeah, drum I send, bus? Yeah, I send a bus from the kick drum. Yeah, and send it to the sans amp. And send it to the sans amp. And then where's the sans amp going relative to where the kick drum's going? The sans amp just has a, on the auxiliary and has an output no. to the mix bus as well. And where's the kick drum having its output? Um, to the mix bus. The so they're both going to the mix bus, same yeah. bus, okay. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why, um, like I said, I only get a problem about a third of the time. It, Otherwise, you know, it's usually and works. if you have the, the problem, do you try to fix it or you just change Well, it? no, here's, here's another one of those things about connecting the dots and not having an expectation is um, if it comes up out of phase, um, I'll say, well, here's an opportunity. Let's see, let's see what I can make out of this. If it doesn't work, then I'll try to fix it. But I don't want to fix it if it's going to work. Yeah, but if it doesn't work, do you do you can you change with the polarity on the sense amp? Uh, well, you, yeah, sure. EQ? Play, try, you know, EQ, um, your phase button. Yeah, they're essentially doing the same kinds of things. Your EQing is changing the phase, right? Just the fact that you're boosting or or subtracting at certain frequencies, you're changing the phase there. Yeah. And then you have your phase button, which does it in even 180, right? Um, so playing with that, high and low pass filters are, you know, do a lot with the sans amp, right? And your phase button. So really manipulating all those things is, you know, is a very powerful tool. If it's still not a sound that you like, it's not desirable to you, then I would say um, take your kick drum track, molt it, right? put the sans amp on that malt. And if that's still giving you a phase problem, then start nudging, sample bass nudge that track until you get something that you like. Yeah? Right. Oh, it was... <laughs> yeah, I was saying to you. How you doing? Okay. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing? I'm fine. I'm so, um, is there a, um, a new technique or process that you are developing now today uh, or nowadays, these days? Is Sorry. there, is there any, anything new that you're trying to develop, um, technique or process, maybe a new oh. um, You're not trying that I, not something that, new? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, well, um, no, you know, I, I, have a bag of, I have a bag of tools, you know, it's like, um, for me, they're like good old tools. And it's the music that changes. It comes to me, and and I, I'm not trying to make everything sound the same. I'm trying to be inspired by the music. But I still have my hammer and my saw, you know, um, and some screws and a nail. And um, and I, I'm, I'm just trying to make things better with the tools that I have. So, um, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not in it. I'm not trying to create anything new besides that see what i mean um does that answer your question yeah yeah well m maybe a new plugin that you're using or whatever um I, you know something the, the whole plugin thing i mean i love plugins um and i have a lot of them but um you know just me working with a plugin or somebody working with a plugin it doesn't mean anything you know it's um it's really about your approach to whatever plugins you have, right? So I can tell you the plug, you know, I've, you know, 
here I've got this plugin today, you know. Well, um, but, but each of your plugins was new one day. Pardon? Each of your plugins was new for you one day. Sure. Yeah. Oh, so that's what you're asking. What do I have that's new? That's a plugin that I'm using. A yeah, or maybe a technique or a process. I mean, something no. that is uh, that you're making up. No, I've, same just, stuff. I've been being you. I've been using the same stuff now for like, um, you know, a couple of years. I, I don't think I've gotten anything new in the last year. Sorry. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Hey, Chad. Yeah, hi. So, uh, no one's asked you about my hour recording yet, and you're quite innovative in that field, so okay. I might as well open that can of worms. Um, so, whether you're using, say, a binaural microphone dummy head, or whether you're doing it yourself, wearing little DPA mics in your ears or whatever like that, afterwards it's always going to translate better to headphones in terms of the 360, the spherical, you know, image. And I'm just wondering if you're looking to um, have that translate well to a studio monitoring, a stereo monitoring setup to kind of get the fishbowl, the 3D kind of a bit more depth. Um, is there any sort of processing you would use on the binaural recordings to actually get it to work with the crossfeed of listening to speakers as opposed to headphones? Yeah, does did everybody hear that about binaural? And does everybody kind of know about binaural okay um yeah it's it's a it's a weird one i you know something i don't really worry about any of it um i like binaural for what it is like i've done a lot of field recording um and uh i, I made my own binaural headset years and years and years ago um microphones that i stick in my ear and record it to a nagra and then a dat machine um and uh and did some really cool recordings with it um and yeah once you put them on speakers it's not binaural anymore because you have crosstalk right the binaural signal has to be pure left and right yeah the minute you get any crosstalk binaural field is gone but what you do get is that thing that you mentioned the fishbowl kind of for me that's what it sounds like when you take a binaural signal and put it on a set of speakers instead of it sounding flat across the front you sort of get this depth you don't get any real spatial cues except for left and right like stereo here so that's um there there are programs that are supposed to have crosstalk rejection all that kind of stuff. i don't think they work very well i've never heard one work very well but i'm not that interested in it i like what binaural does on a set of speakers it's another thing it's different so if you want binaural listen on headphones if you don't or if you don't care then you can listen either way right I think that's cool. I, I'd leave it at that. Um, also, when you start adding, I use a, a binaural head, the Neumann head, the KU100, right? Yeah. I use that as my overhead for the drums. But it's no longer binaural. I just like it because it's fun in the studio. You have a head, you know, in front of the drummer. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it looks cool in the studio. Um, I like the imaging. It's not, you know, it's not crazy wide. Um, and I just got used to it, but it's no longer binaural, I, especially with adding other microphones into the mix. It's, you know, so I'm not really concerned about that. Um, but I will say, I mentioned it at the beginning of this, um, this, uh, shameless plug. Hold on. This is my new toy. And it's a binaural microphone that's on Bluetooth. And it'll pair with your iPhone. Or you can use a wire you can you can use it wired into another unit if you want to, but you can pair it with your iPhone, record it with video if you want. And the microphones sound amazing on it. Better than my microphones of, of the one that I built. And it's so easy to use. Um, I have this in my pocket all the time now. Um, and you know, just be walking around like, oh, I got to get that sound. Put these in, pair it up, bam. It's so cool. I love these. So that's my new, uh, that's my new binaural toy thing. Okay, now I understand what you mean. And I guess, yeah, it's I guess that. 
I guess it's going to become more and more prominent now because of the rise in VR, you know, like yeah. to meld with the visuals. Um, who's the manufacturer again? You mentioned it's a company called Hook Audio. Great. Oh, yeah, I see that. Cool. And it's called the Verse One. And they've just come out. They're new. The guy's been working on them for a long time, and he's finally got them out for sale. They, I think they cost about 230 or $240, but I've already used them. I used them to do a um, panning on the guitar, you know, like put them on and then, um, well, I can't do it there, but you go up to the speaker, you know. Yeah. Move around. Move around and then put that back into the track and you've got a binaural pan. Well, it's not binaural, but it's an interesting pan, you know. Not your normal panning. That answer your question. Oh. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to try that one day. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? I'm all right. Good. I want to ask you um, with how like the business has changed, particularly like with the music and so much more like uh, digital instruments. How do you stay busy with the uh, with with rock being less dominant? Are you doing a lot more international stuff, like, or like are you just changing your style to to get more? clients or well, how do you stay busy and you know how how has the change affected you today yeah um well maybe you know um it's um i'm, I'm doing you know, I, I have expanded like what when, uh, well i know i guess i've always done a lot of mainly singer songwriter stuff um the rock stuff uh i mean that was really the black keys was the first really i guess rock I mean, blues we rock band that I did, I think. Um, all the other stuff had rock elements to it. Um, and that got me into doing the Arctic Monkeys, which was cool. Um, but I think those are, those are anomalies, really. And that was sort of later in my career. That's just like, what, five years ago or six years ago. Um, so I'm still doing singer songwriter things. I, you know, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really notice that it, it's changed much. Um, I'm, um, yeah, it, I, I, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that, but it's just work comes, you know, people call, I listen to the music, I go, yeah, I can make that better. I mean, now that's something that's that's changed for me, is um, I think there was a time where um, there was maybe a, a lot more offers of many different kinds of music, right? A lot more kinds of music that you can pick and choose from and only pick what, you know, wow, I, I love that. It's not so much that these days. Um, nowadays, my main criteria is um, I got to think I can make it better. And then the artist has to, you know, like my idea of making it better. <laughs> because if they don't, then I'm not making it better to me, if you see what I mean. So maybe, I don't know if that answers your question, but that kind of, um, that's changed for me. Well, yeah, I'm just curious because um, there's so many artists now and you never know what budgets are. And but the the run of the mill is that mon is less money out there, but you guys have worked on so many major records, but you don't see as many major rock records like you used to, like in the '90s or even like the early 2000s. So I was just curious for a person like you who works with who's used to working with real instruments, has that changed or have you had to change because of that? Well, um, I mean there is there's a pretty big floating scale of fees these days. You know it's all different. You, you, you really have to have a sliding scale. Um, you know, from free to, uh, you know, major label rates. Um, you, you just get what you can. Um, and it is, it's a lot harder than it, than it was. I'm really fortunate. I, I think I, I got, I got a bit of a name, um, at a time when the business was still good, the tail end of the really good times in the business, you know, uh, there was a lot of money floating around. Um, I really liked those times. It was, some people thought it was wasteful, but I, I thought it was like, um, I thought it was like, um, uh, it was creative, you know, having all that money to throw around, being in a studio, writing music in a studio, um, you know, camping out in the studio. That was cool. Even, and, and I'm talking about not big bands. I'm talking about bands like Los Lobos, um, or Stina Nordenstam or Lisa Germano, Soul Coffee. Um, you know, you could actually sit in the studio and, and, and not have to watch the clock. Um, that was, those were pretty good days, and that has really changed. 
the main thing that's changed for me is I'm mostly mixing and I mix at home. So I, I can control my rates um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think that's a big deal. And I'm loving it. I love working at home. Yeah. Um, so uh, I really love the style you record drums, especially, and I mean everything. But um, and how do you approach? How do you prefer to record a rock band, like just live, everyone live recording, or or separate? You know, everyone recording separate. Oh, I like live, of course. You know, I, 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 I love live bands. I think get it live, but I also like, um, for me, recording um, I'm, it is a fantasy. Yeah, I like the fantasy of the studio. So, in recording live, the only thing I care about live is, is that you're just getting a feel because we're, all we're doing is trying to communicate. That's all music is about, is communicating, right? And to communicate, we're doing that with emotions, trying to take somebody on a little bit of a ride emotionally. Yeah, you know? and that's how I'm looking at it. So, um, usually, um, I, I respond to live recordings where um, you have a flow of music. I don't like clicks, you know. I like things speeding up, slowing down. Um, I, you know, I don't like tuners. I like things being a little out of tune. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, so, yeah, so the, that fits in all fully i think with the live recording thing it doesn't mean that you know you can't have fun adding on top of that piecing things together because that's part of the fantasy in the studio i want to create a fantasy world not a live record i'm not interested in making a band sound like they do on stage that's not what i want to do i want it i want it to be something that can't happen you know on stage do you know what i mean yeah Go see a band live if you want to see them live and have the studio be for another world, you know. Nice. What are, speaking of which, some of your favorite uh, rooms that you've worked in, say for drums and guitars, etc., what are your, some of your favorite sonically uh, rooms to work in? Uh, my, my favorite room ever was uh, Studio B at the Sound Factory in uh, Los Angeles. The drum room was, um, I mean, about a, a quarter the size of this stage. You could just fit the drummer and the drums in the room. Mic stands almost didn't fit. Um, I love small little dead rooms for drums, tiny little things where, where the sound is just compressing into the drums as it's playing. I love that. Um, and that's part of what helped me or got me developing what I do with compression and distortion because I use those things instead of reverb to get length. You know, like snare drum might be dead and short, um, cymbals too. Um, so then you get a compressor, a nice crunchy compressor, and just add a little bit of that in, lengthening the, the tail end of the, the cymbals. Distortion, like distort, put distortion on your kick, and it'll probably the snare drum's probably leaking into your kick. And we know what distortion boxes do; they usually bring up every bit of noise on the signal, right? So that'll bring up your snare drum a little bit, and then you get a nice length on the snare drum. It's kind of like reverb. So um, that's one place. Um, the, the Magic Shop was another really. I think that's gone now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, that was another lovely, they had a little vocal booth that I used as a drum booth. Fantastic place. And real world studios, I think those are my three, like, favorite places. Yeah. How's it going? Yeah, it's all right. So how do you treat uh, your background vocals uh, with reverb, reverberation? Um, well, I mean, I it's mean, different. Name some names. I say name some names, like plug in names. Plug in names of, of reverbs that you would use. Oh, reverbs. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, there's just there's a lot, you know. I mean, there is, there is and, a whole lot. And again, you know, a lot of times, I'm, you know, I make a I'll make a decision, um, you know, based on if like something I need something smooth that just sounds um, that I can get length and shimmer. I might go with Valhalla. You know, I love that set of plugins. There's a whole set of those. Um, 
There's the PSP spring box, which has a whole range of sounds from pinging spring to really smooth, beautiful, watery spring. There's the AKG BX20 UAD. That's, that may be my favorite reverb of all time, actually. The UAD? The UAD BX20. Even in the, from the analog world, I, I think that that is such a beautiful sounding reverb. Altiverb, I use a lot. Calls Living Room and Altiverb. I don't know if you know that setting, but that's amazing. Um, speakerphone. Um, I got lost with that speakerphone. It, it seemed like it just had... Isn't that wonderful? You can get lost with that speakerphone. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's good. Get lost in it, man. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> um, when when you're uh, distorting drums to like bring out uh, the length of them, do you end up utilizing any like gates or anything to kind of con control that in any way? Sure, not not all the time, but yeah, and the, you know anything and everything. Yeah. If if it if it's out there, I probably use it at some point. You know? right. I, I I've got no rules about any of that stuff. So yeah, if I need to use a gate, I'll use a gate. What 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 would you end up using a gate for? Like what what instances? Um, well, it it, uh, it may be that I want that sound. I just want it to go clean from distortion, right to clean, um, nonlinear. Maybe mm -hmm. you know, if I want it to sound really unnatural, sure. um, maybe the distortion you know comes up, and I think, wow, that sounds wonderful. But then in the bridge, it needs to clean up, but I don't want to lose the distortion entirely. Um, I mean, the, any number of reasons, you know, the same reasons that you would have for using a gate. Do, do you find yourself doing that to control, like, symbol stuff, like symbol things that are coming out because of the distortion? It, it can be. It can be, you know, pedal squeak. It can be um, extra extraneous um, strainer noise. Sure. Anything, you know, whatever you can think of is probably what I'm doing, all right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there's no, nothing special. It's just... Um, it's troubleshooting and then fixing a problem with the tools that you have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi. Hey. You say that you mix at home. Uh, what kind of uh, equipment do you use? Do you use uh, analog summing? Do you do you do you use analog summing? No. No. You all in the box. In the box. Okay. Yeah. I'm. You know. Everybody like. I. I just think. Um, you know, everybody's so different and and what they hear right mm -hmm. and and we all know how weird psychologically sound is and we were talking about this yesterday too as i you know i'm sure everybody here has you know spent you know two or three minutes eqing something and then gone and done something else come back to find out and say wow now that sounds right and then you go back and you find out that that eq's bypassed that you were using well it's a real thing that happens with human hearing um that uh, your brain meets expectation, right? So um, I think, uh, um, you know, for some people, uh, for me that relates to this, um, I don't really, I don't have expectations of what I want in, uh, I don't have a love affair with analog, I'm not trying to get analog. When I use plugins, I'm not trying to sound analog. Plugins are plugins. I don't know, uh, you know, all the plugin people are going to hate me around here, all the, the vendors, but I don't, I, there's not one plugin out there that's a tape plugin that sounds like tape to me. Not one. But they sound great. You know, I, I love the UAD Studer and the ATR 100. I, um, Satin. This, for me, uh, that, that's such an incredibly useful plugin. Do you know that one? Uh, uh, um, the Massey tape, um, what's it called, tape head. Um, but they don't sound like tape. Um, and I, I don't, I, I, do you know with these new tools, I don't want to sound like tape. Tape's tape. People have been doing that for years. Why do you want to, why does, why does everybody have this love affair? Um, it, it doesn't mean that I wouldn't use tape. I'm just saying, you know, look at them as different tools and they're all useful. And use what you have, what's good for your budget, what's good for convenience. For me, it's digital. It's too expensive for me to have any kind of tape and analog stuff. Um, I like simplicity. I'm lazy. I just want to go and 
put something up and start mixing. I don't want to have an extra box in there that I have to worry about. So no, 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 anal no. Yeah, long-winded way of saying no. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Sorry, no analog summing. No, I, I, I'm not oh, just not. I'm just not bothered by it. You know, I my ears aren't that good. You can you can play me through the analog box. You can play me digital. You can play me four four one sixteen. You can play me ninety six twenty four. I'm going to go, uh, yeah, okay. I think I hear a difference, but, um, you know, at that point, you got to ask yourself, does it matter? I mean, does it matter to us and most people listening? Um, the, um, I think it's, it's really good. There, I'm glad there's people out there doing that with equipment, mastering engineers that need to think about those things, that do think about it. I think it's great. But I don't feel like I need to. I'll use anything. At any sample rate, I don't care. I just want to make. I just want to make music, you know. <sighs> Hello, good morning. Hi. There's an issue with like a bitey hi hat, and it's just really peaky and high frequencies, and it's just grating. What kinds of things might you start reaching for to soften it, to push it into the back, to smooth it out? Um. It, it, it depends on the context of it. Like, um, if if you have a way of getting at the hi hat, if it's just the hi hat, I mean, if it's in your overheads, then it is a, it's a different approach, right? Something else you got to do. If, if you're just talking about a hi hat and you want to, um, you know, because it's me and it's my one of my main tools is that I probably put a sans amp on it. Yeah, and I mean, everybody's laughing because you're probably thinking, oh, we'll distort it. No, I don't use Sansam for distortion all the time. It's an EQ. It's a wonderful, wonderful EQ. Don't, it, it, it is distorting. It will distort it, but you don't have to have audible, noticeable distortion. And it does a wonderful job of softening things um, just like that. So you could try that. The obvious things are just, you know, pretty sharp Q dipping EQs. I don't know. You know, some kind of compression um, to add in with the dipping EQ, maybe to give the hi-hat some life if you lose life by taking that frequency out. Um, if you have overheads that's got a hi-hat in it, that's okay, then just don't use the hi-hat mic. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's all right. How often do you put headphones on when you're mixing? Um, you know, all these years. And I love headphones and binaural, um, but I never listened to anything on headphones, mixing or... Um, I've just started to because I've moved to a, a new house and um, I'm having trouble with my monitors. And I thought, uh, and I heard, you know, Andrew's been talking about mixing on headphones. I thought, well, well, if he can do it, I, you know, I better be able to do it. So I've... You know, just in the last 10 days, I've started putting some headphones on and see if I can get a handle on it. Um, I've, I've always had trouble with it, uh, but I, headphones have changed. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot more options for, for it. Um, so I am going to explore it. I still find it scary um, because I find that the headphones make me do things less extreme. If you see what I mean. All of a sudden, now I'm going to get a little bit timid, and I don't want to do that. You know? If you could be any animal, what would it be? Uh, gosh, you know, a, a human. Yeah. Okay.